All right. Uh, welcome, at, welcome, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Colin Jomek. I'm the chair of the Environmental Studies Department here at NYU. Um, and we are here to celebrate and discuss Jeff Sebo's new book, Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, Why Animals Matter for Pandemics, Climate Change, and Other Catastrophes. Uh, we've got two great panelists who are going to offer some comments on Jeff's book, and he will have an opportunity to respond, uh, Kendra Coulter and Doug Kaiser. So just to briefly say how this is going to go, ugh, unbelievable, alarm goes off. Um, so Jeff's going to give a very brief overview of his book, just like a few minutes, and then uh, Kendra and Doug will deliver some remarks, and then Jeff will have a brief opportunity to respond to the panelists, and then we'll open it up for a question and answer. I ask that you write, audience, if you've got uh, questions or comments, that you write them down, and they'll be put into the chat, and then uh, I'll take it from there and read them out. And so uh, we'll just get right into it. We're, Jeff's going to go first. So Jeff Sebo is Associate Clinical Professor of Environmental Studies here at NYU, where he's also an affiliated professor of bioethics, medical ethics, and philosophy. He, uh, importantly, also directs the Animal Studies MA program. He's the founding director of one of the first animal studies programs in the United States. Uh, in addition to this book, Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, he's co-authored two other books and numerous articles that, in my opinion, all break new ground in making the case for animal protection and animal rights. And with that, Jeff, I turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Colin, uh, for that introduction and, and for chairing the session. And, and to Kendra and, and Doug, thanks so much for, for being here and reading the book and preparing comments about it. I really appreciate that. And also everybody attending the, the webinar, especially at this time in the semester. Thanks for being here and, and being willing to talk about this. It means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. So just for uh, a quick overview of the book, the, the main idea of the book is that animals are central to global health and environmental threats like pandemics and climate change, both as causes through no faults of their own and as victims in the sense that our use, our exploitation and extermination of animals in industries like factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade are major contributors to threats like pandemics and climate change. And threats like pandemics and climate change are major contributors to biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and human and non-human animal suffering, both directly and indirectly in the sense that they introduce new threats that we confront and they amplify existing threats that we already face, like hunger and thirst and illness and injury and so on and so forth. And so my argument is that given these links between animals and pandemics and climate change and other threats, we have a responsibility both to reduce our use of animals as part of our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts and increase our support for animals as part of our pandemic and climate change adaptation efforts. So as we seek to reduce the risk of future pandemics, reduce the severity of climate change, we need to phase down industries like factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade and phase up humane, healthful and sustainable alternatives. And as we seek to build resilient and sustainable cities and food systems and transportation systems of the future, we also need to consider the interests of humans and non-humans at the same time so that we can make these new structures accommodating for the multi-species community that will occupy them. And so in the book, I talk about these issues. I make the case for including animals in these policies. I talk about different policy areas where we can do this, improving advocacy and research, education, employment, social services, infrastructure, and I consider some of the deeper questions that we need to ask in order to make sense of all this about, for example, the fundamental legal and political status animals should have, about how to make interspecies health and welfare comparisons for purposes of informing public policy, and about how to wrap our minds around the fact that all global human cause changes are going to not only impact currently existing animals, but change population levels in the future, cause some populations to contract and others to expand. And we need to account for those expected impacts as well. And the general message of the book is that these issues are both urgent and complex. We need to be addressing them. We need to be including animals in health and environmental advocacy and policy in these ways, but we currently have very little knowledge and power and motivation to do that well. So we have to brace our responsibilities and our limitations in equal measure. 
And we can't use our responsibilities as license to ignore our limitations, nor can we use our limitations as license to ignore our responsibilities. And, and that raises a bunch of difficult questions about how in practice to proceed. Uh, so we need to proceed and we need to think really carefully about how. And I'll leave it there and I'm looking forward to the commentaries. Thank you. Incredible, Jeff managed to use only three of the five minutes allotted to him, which included thank yous to other people. So, um, all right, so our first commentator panelist is Dr. Kendra Coulter, who's the Chancellor's Chair for Research Excellence and an Associate Professor in the Department of Labor Studies at Brock University. She's a fellow of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics, a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists, and the author of Animals Work and the Promise of Interspecies Solidarity, as well as the forthcoming Defending Animals Inside the Front Lines of Animal Protection. She's also co-editor of Animal Labor, A New Frontier of Interspecies Justice, with a question mark at the end. And apparently, I just learned that on July 1st, she'll be joining Huron University as college professor in management and organizational studies. Dr. Kendra Coulter, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Colin, and to, uh, to everyone who's brought us together for this wonderful celebration uh, of Jesse Bo's new book. I'm joining you from the traditional treaty and unceded territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Lenape, and Attawandron peoples, or what we now call Southern Ontario. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a, a pleasure to, to be able to share a few thoughts uh, about this new book. And the, and the first little cluster of dimensions I want to highlight about it is that this is, book is very accessible. It's very in inclusive. The word inclusion is used a lot, but I think the book itself is very inclusive. Now, that doesn't mean that it's simplistic or reductionist, and I'm going to return to that uh, in a moment, but it, its accessibility is really one of its strengths. And simultaneously, it's expansive. I love that the breadth of issues that are being covered, um, the approaches interweaving different schools of thought, different ways of acting and thinking in the world. Um, and it's really a book about interconnectedness. Um, and, and not only the, the why we're interconnected, why animals matter, why multiple species matter, but the how. And, and Jeff could have remained in that comfortable terrain of just the why, um, uh, more familiar terrain for philosophers in particular, but he, he rejected that confine and said, no, we need to be thinking about what do we do about this? Um, how can we put these ideas into, into action? And so my favorite chapter uh, is called Methods for Inclusion. Uh, and message for including animals. And it's and, and, and laudably Jeff begins with probably the most significant way we want to be thinking about translating these ideas into action, which is in the realm of the economy and work. And so Jeff highlights harmful industries and how we can be instead moving away from harmful industries towards support for alternatives. And so this is uh, you know, building on a, a broader constellation of work on what some have called the just transition for agriculture. It's what I've called humane jobs transitions. It's about how we shift our economic activities away from harmful to helpful work for people. He moves beyond that. Uh, to thinking about how we can include animals in impact assessments, education, and uh, social services, infrastructure. And in many ways, this is spelling out and articulating and elucidating for us what is already the reality, which is that we live in multi-species communities. Many of us live in multi-species families. We all live on a multi-species world. So why aren't we thinking and acting more carefully and with more care? So there's a slogan that circulates around sometimes uh, that says humans, we're not the only species, we just act like it. And I would say this book's core message is let's not. Let's not act like we're the only species. This is about thinking through the ways that we can be including other species, not only in our responses to existing problems, but also to our plans and our visions and our thinking ahead. So as someone outside the US, I think I can confidently say, sometimes you have a bit of funny language in your political culture where other parts of the world are like, I don't quite know if that word means what you think it means, uh, et cetera. And words like socialism and capitalism, uh, et cetera, might fall into that, into that category. Um, and so what I see in Jeff's, uh, in, in Jeff's vision is what we might call a social democratic vision, um, which is, um, seeing the progressive, seeing the possible, 
and maybe not necessarily relying on conventional allies, despite it perhaps fitting in some, 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 some more comfortable or established ways of thinking and political thought. But this might be challenging us to identify new possibilities, to forge new coalitions. And that's something I've found challenging, is seeing the stakeholders that might logically form a constellation, are they going to around these issues? But I think Jeff's call is that increasingly, yes, they need to, and it's going to take work and it's going to take strategic thinking to identify those, those new possibilities. That said, there can also be some cross-partisan alliances and, and agreement on these issues. Uh, what those will be and how those will play out, I think will vary, and we can discuss them perhaps as a group, or, and I think those are going to be the, the, some of the core challenges of putting this into, into action in, in the years to come. How can we forge alliances with people we expect to collaborate with and maybe with some we don't? And what I love as well about this is that I, I feel this acceptance right from the get-go that this is a reality that's imperfect and our proposals are going to be imperfect and that's okay. We're going to do our best. We're going to, uh, to, to establish our non-negotiables, but that we understand that this is a challenging terrain conceptually, practically, economically, geographically, and, and that we need to be accepting the imperfect and making change. So to return to what I began with, this idea of it's not simple, it's not simplistic, and, and that Jeff sort of eschews and rejects the overly simplistic, I think the truth is that we can't, unfortunately, offer these tidy, tidy sound bites that will make everything uh, correctable or fixable and, and really speak to people. But at the same time, there are some dimensions of this that are very straightforward, that are very understandable. If we can cross these bridges, if we can translate these complicated ideas into accessible, inclusive language and invite people. In many ways, this book is an invitation. And that I think is, is really, really key and really, really important. So in it, I hear what I might call pragmatic optimism, or if that's too overstated, maybe pragmatic hope. Uh, and, uh, and, and, I, and, and or if a stubborn commitment to hope. And I wanna sort of take a, word, a sentence from, from Raymond Williams and modify it a little bit, and that the real challenge is to make hope possible rather than despair suffocating. And that we, we, we have that hope and it, it, is our, it is our engine, but that we, we have to move to the realm of action. We have to be doing something about it. We have to do, be doing many things about this challenge. Um, and so hope and action are, are, are really in many ways, I think the, the, the core message of and fundamental message of this book. I feel like this book has a gentle smile. It's about possibility. Uh, and, and, and it's about moving from, from not only hope, but, but to, to action. And, 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 and neither, uh, and, if, and if we are to have any chance of saving animals and saving ourselves, we need both hope and action. And Jeff has invited us to have both. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Coulter, and another a uh, stellar job at staying below a lot of time. <laughs> We're breezing through this. Um, so, so what I might, um, I'll, I'll move on to our next panelist, but I might invite um, you back if there's some particular questions you want to pose to, to Jeff. Um, we, we will, we'll probably have time to entertain those. So uh, our next panelist is Doug Kaiser, who's the Joseph M. Field 55 Professor of Law at Yale Law School and the faculty co-director of the Law, Ethics, and Animals program there, which is a great friend of the Animal Studies uh, Initiative here at NYU. His teaching and research areas include torts, animal law, environmental law, climate change, products liability, and risk regulation. And with that, Doug, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Colin. Um, uh, I definitely want to thank Colin and Mari and also the amazing Dale Jamison for um, inviting me to be a part of this event and for putting it on. Um, and I'd like to just start by congratulating Jeff um, and thanking him for writing the book. Uh, it's a hugely ambitious work. Uh, it covers some of the gravest challenges facing life on the planet. It does so not only from the perspective of moral philosophy, but also with copious insights from political and legal theory, all backed by careful research in natural and social scientific literatures to support the book's urgent empirical claims. In other words, this is a major contribution, one that I know will be read widely and relied upon frequently by the many academics, advocates, and others who are invested in helping to bring about a planet with less suffering for humans and non-humans alike. Um, all that said, the book is not entirely a, a triumph 
Um, for there's the small matter of two appallingly bad philosophy puns in chapter eight. And uh, Jeff will someday have to answer for those puns. I'm, I'm willing to overlook it uh, today, though, so as not to distract from, from what really should be a celebratory event. In my comments, I want to say a bit more about how I see the book working and why I regard it as working so effectively. Uh, and then I'll close by saying a bit about the kinds of profound questions that the book raises for all of us as we live in the Anthropocene. The book I, I take is primarily addressed to people who accept the idea that sentient non-humans have a baseline entitlement to being considered within morality, within law and politics, and also that uh, our dominant systems fail to honor uh, that entitlement at present. I don't take Jeff to be trying to make the case for the baseline entitlement itself. Instead, I take him to be speaking to those of us who already accept it. And his message to us seems to be, pull yourselves together. Stop. Now is not the time for narrow internecine squabbling. It's a crisis. Focus on what unites us rather than what divides us. Start reaching out also to all those other progressive communities that share an interest in addressing planetary crises like climate change, like deforestation, like wildlife exploitation, and so on. Um, so th this comes through most clearly for me in chapter two, where Jeff lays out in clear, accessible terms the two dominant philosophical frameworks for thinking about how to morally regard non-human animals. This is familiar rights versus welfare territory, but what Je Jeff does beautifully is to studiously avoid the versus part. His is a deliberately pluralist moral framework. He's careful to emphasize that his aim is, in Jeff's words, not to develop a particular moral theory, but rather to develop a general moral framework that can serve as the basis for coalition building. So in so doing, he helps us to avoid the circular firing squad trap that has long characterized the rights versus welfare debate within the animal protection movement. He doesn't ignore or deny the fact that some animal protection issues can give rise to very sincere and very serious differences of view, even among animal advocates. But he implores us not to let those areas of difference overshadow the shared interests we all have in addressing massive threats like climate or like biodiversity loss, which are, after all, by orders of magnitude, far greater threats to animals than the practices or policies on which our views might differ. So this feature of intentional pluralism in the book is, is both refreshing and I think urgently needed. A second feature um, that I really, really um, resonated with in the book is what I would call a pragmatic radicalism. Now, Kendra mentioned pragmatic optimism. I think there's also a kind of prag pragmatically radical aspect to the book. Jeff tries very hard as an author to be careful, even-handed, and above all, practical. But he obviously also cares about the issues too much to remain purely incremental and modest in the proposal. He recognizes that ultimately some forms of radical or even revolutionary change is going to be needed to fully meet the scale of the challenges before us. So what Jeff does in response to sort of thread the needle is to offer policy proposals that can work on two different levels simultaneously. First, they're modest and practical enough to have a realistic chance of being um, passed and implemented and, and have impact. But they also contain within them seeds of potential further development that could help effectuate longer term structural change. As Jeff writes on page 165, while my policy proposals will help many humans and non-humans in the short term, they are important primarily because they will help us build knowledge, power, and political will toward helping humans and non-humans more ethically and effectively in the long run. Now, this, this sort of twin uh, level approach allows Jeff to acknowledge the reality that many of our policy choices at present do seem to present a dilemma of tragic trade-offs in which one group or interest appears to have to be sacrificed for the benefit of another. But Jeff steadfastly avoids falling into the tragic trade-offs trap in which that sort of harsh zero-sum depiction of our social ordering is taken to be inevitable. He's never content to lead the trade-offs unexamined. Instead, he demands that we widen the lens out, both structurally and across time, to ask, how did we as a society get into this position where tragic trade-offs seem 
so starkly posed and unavoidable? How could we have shaped our systems differently so that all of the affected groups and interests could be supported rather than having some cast aside in the name of others' progress? Now, the great benefit of this approach is it avoids a different kind of circular firing squad trap that plagues progressive movements more broadly. Certain temporary policy decisions do seem to pit the interest of, say, slaughterhouse workers versus factory farmed animals, or an endangered species habitat versus affordable housing. We could go on and on. That zero-sum way of looking at policy decisions then becomes tailor-made to cause labor, consumer, public health, environment, animal protection, and other progressive groups um, to squabble among each other and against each other rather than to unite around a shared vision of a more broadly caring society. As Jeff demonstrates throughout the book, there's almost always some structural and or longer term policy change that could be adopted that would benefit all the disaffected interests who are instead made to feel at war with one another within a narrow problem framing. Okay. Let me um, turn now to two of the theoretical questions that Jeff raises for us to struggle with as part of uh, the intellectual labor of living in the Anthropocene. First, although throughout the book, Jeff assumes only sentient beings are eligible for moral considerability, he raises questions about this limitation uh, later on in the book. Um, for instance, he speculates that we may ultimately come to the view that some plants uh, should be seen as sentient beings given uh, our, our knowledge of their capabilities uh, and, and what may come with further scientific investigation. He also seems open to the possibility that the test for inclusion as a subject could be drawn more widely than sentience. We could find some other test for inclusion. And I'm quite sympathetic to the direction Jeff is going here. And in fact, I would, I would push it even farther. Um, I would call out for more direct criticism, the analytic approach of ontology as first philosophy. This is the approach in which first we ask, what is this other? And then our answer to that question comes to determine what we believe we owe to the other. Um, from a perspective, instead of ethics as first philosophy, the thought process might be quite different. To acknowledge another life form as a source of ethical obligation, would not be to examine a set of empirical descriptions about that other life form in order to see whether it measures up, but instead it would be to find ethical obligation precisely in the unknowability of the other's interior world. From, from this sort of perspective, we wouldn't think of ourselves as already entering into the world as self-possessed liberal subjects equipped with capacities like reason and discourse that enable justice relations with those we deem worthy of us, uh, instead, we would see ourselves as emerging into consciousness already hostage to the other, uh, already placed under uh, the infinite obligation of care that Levinas identifies. Um, in, in this perspective, subjectivity would not be assigned to the other by us based on our assessment that they hold a point of view consistent with our criteria for considerability. Instead, subjectivity would be assigned to us in the form of a piercing recognition of responsibility, one that even precedes self-understanding and awareness. Without allowing ourselves to be shot through in that sense by the possibility of others suffering and our complicity in it, our responsibility for it, ethics is in danger of becoming susceptible to simple thematization, politics to rationalization, and even the most horrific neglect and abuse to normalization regard for the other becomes a matter of finding the correct line of moral considerability, the line that can't be rationally or empirically doubted, rather than a matter of openly experiencing pleas for recognition that cannot be denied. Okay, second, and after this I promise to shut up. Second, Jeff implores us to think about the challenge of dramatically reforming, or even, he writes, replacing the Enlightenment traditions of liberalism, democracy, and capitalism. He also writes on page 140, we need to fundamentally transform how we relate to vulnerable others through law and politics. I could not agree more, um, but I also want to acknowledge how dangerous a historical moment this is for us to reopen the basic ordering structures of society. In thinking about how to reform constitutional democracy, it's helpful to remember that at its theoretical heart, constitutional democracy suffers from 
forgive me, a chicken or egg problem, which is this. Le legitimation of the Constitution demands approval through popular sovereignty, but the popular sovereign's approval has to be discerned through principles of constitutional law that already somehow have been legitimated. Um, there's a paradox there, and it's a paradox that can't actually be resolved analytically. Instead, it just simply lives on in the continuing and never completely successful efforts of a political community to overcome that foundational tension, to demonstrate the continued vitality of the performative utterance, we the people. That utterance first constitutes the political community as a community, even as it represents the community as somehow already formed. So membership in essence is always at issue in lawmaking. Every single instance of social choice raises anew the question, are we the people? Are, are they we? Who is not? In ordinary times, these ideas might seem elusive or difficult to grasp um, and hard to envision as having a kind of concrete impact on our lives. But America of late, like many other representative democracies around the world, has felt much closer than usual to this brittle, irreconcilable foundation. The walls that in truth we are always building to define who is in and who is out, those walls seem far more visible and less metaphorical today than they do in ordinary times. We're in the midst of a grand renegotiation of who we the people are with our raw disagreement over questions of membership and identity being exposed in unsettling, even terrifying ways. So it's in that fraught and fragile historical moment that Jeff's book arrives and calls us to realize not just our best collective self, but as a society calls us to build a society in which selfhood itself has been radically reimagined. That is a bold and vital call to action. And it is one that I desperately hope we will be equal to. So Jeff, congratulations again on a terrific book puns and all. Great, thanks so much, Doug. Um, so Jeff now has an opportunity to respond. I did want um, to, I, Kendra, if I, given, given the brevity of your comments, if there was, if there was uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity quickly if you wanted, if there was particular questions that you wanted Jeff to ponder um, you know, uh, to, to leave him with. Uh, I wanted to invite you to do so. Otherwise, Jeff can just respond and you can jump in later. It's up to you. I think Jeff has lots of material to work with. I'm keen to hear what he has to say in response. Okay, well, well, thank you so much to, to both of you. I, I, I think we all know how strange it can be to, to spend months and months and months and months working on something and getting feedback every now and then, and then send it off into the world and see whether how people respond. And, and so for you to have read it and, and to offer such generous uh, commentary, it really means a lot. And, and I really appreciate that. And, and I also really appreciate in particular, you're picking up on and articulating exactly some of the main themes I was hoping to convey in different terms. It, it suggests to me that that at least that much I, I succeeded at, at at conveying that I think these are these are some of the most important issues and themes that we need to be think, thinking about. So so yeah, thank thank you very much. Um, just to pick up on a, a few things that you each talked about and, and maybe respond to to some of uh, Doug's questions and challenges in particular. I love that you both picked up on these ideas of, and, and your way of putting it too, uh, pragmatic optimism and pragmatic radicalism, because those are definitely both uh, in the book and in my way of thinking about these issues. I do think that we need to cultivate a sense of optimism, but then as you say, Kendra, we also need to take action in ways that make that optimism or that hope earned and credible, rather than having optimism or hope that has no basis in evidence or reality because of our unwillingness to do anything at all to create the kinds of possibilities that will result in the future we might be hoping for. Uh, so, so I love that idea, that term, pragmatic optimism. And similarly with pragmatic radicalism, uh, I, I agree that we need to ultimately be imagining and aiming for radically different futures, radically different social and political and economic systems and even ecologies, ways of building our shared environments and interacting uh, with, with other human and non-human animals. But at the same time, we need to recognize that, Doug, as you say, we are living in a fraught moment where 
democracies are being challenged, liberalism is being challenged, and the world is dealing with a pandemic, the world is dealing with fires and floods and, and other threats, the world is dealing with inflation. And in the US context, at least, we have a hard time passing any legislation at all at the federal level to say nothing of transformative legislation that would uh, extend new benefits to non-human animals all the way to insects. And so we need to be radical, but we also need to be pragmatic and, and we need to be willing to, Doug, as, as you say, uh, create policies, pursue policies that are tractable in the short term, that might involve some trade-offs in the short term so that we can build knowledge, build power, build political will towards more ethical, more effective future policies that, that might be able to dissolve some of those trade-offs rather than merely resolving them in a net positive way. So I just love that you emphasize those themes and, and I wanna thank you for that. Doug, with respect to your uh, two, two challenges. Oh, sorry, three challenges. I, I simply reject the idea that puns are bad. I think no matter how serious and grave a topic is, no matter how important uh, a, a, a argument is, there is always room for puns. And once we've lost a willingness to include puns in our policy proposals, then, then all is truly lost. And so, so I did include two puns in chapter eight. I am not sorry for it. And I am going to leave that there. Uh, with respect to your other two questions and challenges, first of all, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of interesting questions to ask about where we should take ethics in the future. And as, as you note, throughout the book, I assume that at least all sentient beings, that is at least all beings capable of experiencing happiness and suffering, at least they count. And then we can keep an open mind moving forward about whether other beings count too, like living beings or, or beings with whom we have certain types of relationships. And, and I wanna keep an open mind about that because humans have always been wrong and under-inclusive in the past and we might still be doing that now. But then you say maybe we should radically reconsider it in a different sense, not just by expanding our circle of moral concern, but also by uh, altering how we approach the beings we might be rethinking our relationships with. And instead of looking at their ontology, asking what are they like, and then extending consideration to them or not, we should instead, in some sense, take the, the Levinas approach of encountering them and experiencing them and being confronted by their unknowable subjectivity and extending consideration to them on that basis. And this is a longer conversation, but what I have never been able to fully get to the bottom of is how much that is an actual substantive difference from the analytic approach versus a very different way of describing a somewhat sentientist analytic approach. Because of course, uh, what sentience is, is possessing a certain kind of subjectivity, uh, having a conscious mind, it being, there, there is something that it is like to be you, and then you can experience things that are good or bad for you, pleasure, pain, happiness, suffering, and so on. So when an analytic sentient says, hey, which beings are sentient, which beings have subjectivity, that is another way of saying, uh, yeah, which, which beings can I have this Levinasian interaction with, right? And, and so then maybe the only debate is about what the best way to figure out the answer to that question is. Is it by looking for some sort of proxy like neurons, or is it by having an encounter and, and being exposed to their subjectivity perceptually? And I don't know, I mean, our perceptions are biased and our metrics are biased, everything is biased. This is all unknowable. We are, are uncertain about, about which other beings are sentient and what their minds and experiences might be like. So I think to some degree, we need to use our experiences to inform our understanding of which beings have sentience or subjectivity, but to some degree, we need to search for other proxies too. And that I think is one of the central questions we need to be working on. So I'll leave that there for now, but I'd, I'd love to keep talking about how we need to be expanding our ethical understandings moving forward, because that does seem pivotal. With respect to your other issue, uh, other challenge briefly, uh, you note that I do call for, and, and I don't make this a central uh, uh, feature of the book, but I do note at the margins that while this book is operating within the frameworks of capitalism, liberalism, and democracy, and we can make positive changes within capitalism, liberalism, and democracy, 
we should always keep in mind the possibility that we might need to at some point move beyond these structures, either by altering them so much that we might as well give them a different name or simply by rejecting them and replacing them with something else. Now, I don't suggest that lightly. And I do think, think that for now, especially given this perilous political moment, the, the safest and most tractable thing to do is to explore uh, improvements within capitalism, liberalism, and democracy, asking, for example, what would capitalism look like if animals could own property rather than be owned as property, asking what liberalism would look like if, if animals' right to liberty could be respected too, and asking what democracy would look like if animals' voices were considered as part of the political process and if they were included as members um, to whom the government was accountable. So I think we can start by asking what capitalism, liberalism, and democracy would look like in those ways, uh, but we should never take any existing system for granted. And when we see how badly, in some respects, current systems are working, it at least makes sense to be asking broad foundational questions along the way about what ways of organizing our, ourselves might be possible in the future and what might be desirable. And, and so I don't get to the bottom of that here, but I, I basically think that we, we need to keep that question in mind rather than taking anything for granted. And I'll stop there uh, to see if, if you have any responses or if uh, other people would like to jump in with questions. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I Just to remind people, uh, there's the link that you can go to order the book. It's, aside from being an amazing book, it has a stunning photograph on the cover of this uh, kangaroo with the burnout landscape in the back. It's really a stunning. You can see in the back of Doug's screen there. It looks very nice on the shelf. So in addition to the content, it also makes a lovely uh, visual visual background. It's a beautiful uh, <laughs> award-winning photo from fellow Canadian Joanne MacArthur of We Animals. That's right. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joe, for, for the use of that photograph. Actually, she, she provided photos for two of my three books so far. So, Incredible. so thank you for the chimpanzee rights photo as well. Nice. So we, you have gotten some uh, questions and a reminder to folks to drop your questions into the Q&A chat. I won't read the congratulations that have come in, Jeff, but you can read those too. Um, but so there's a few. And so I'll start with the first one. You'll respond and then I'll go to the next one and we'll, we'll go from there. And, and Doug and Kendra, please... Uh, you know, you, you have discretion to jump back in to ask some questions or, or you know, say something. We, we invited you because we want to hear what you have to say and, and, and to provide your imprint on the events as well. So, uh, Jeff, the first question that I'll, I'll start with from Anonymous says, uh, many mainstream climate conversations view animal issues as only marginally important. Thank you for making this link between animal issues and climate issues accessible. Was part of your motivation in writing this book to bring more people into the animal protection cause via pivoting people who are already interested in climate? I th thank you for the question. I suppose so. I, as, as Kendra and, and Doug mentioned, I am really interested in finding new opportunities for coalition building. And I think there are so many low hanging fruit opportunities for coalition building because for instance, industries like factory farming, deforestation and the wildlife trade are at one and the same time so bad for humans and animals and the environment, particularly the most vulnerable members of human and non-human populations. And so uh, no matter what cause area people are working in, we should have a shared interest in phasing down these industries and phasing up alternatives. But in addition to trying to bring new people in, I also want to challenge people who are already in the coalition to think about these issues holistically, because it might not be enough to say that I want to address food issues because of climate issues, they want to do it because of health issues, and they want to do it because of animal issues, because there might be some aspects of the meat industry that are a little bit worse for animals or health or the climate. For example, if all you are thinking about is the climate, you might think, hey, we should replace beef and dairy with chicken and fish because those are a little bit less bad for climate change. But the reality is those are worse for animal welfare and mixed for public health issues like pandemics. And so the only way to really get a sense of how to effectively phase these industries down and phase up alternatives is to have some appreciation of how all of these different, different issues intersect. So uh, in addition to wanting to bring new people into the coalition. I want every party in the coalition to have at least a baseline appreciation of the other issues that are relevant so that we can all be thinking together about how to reduce harm across the board rather than simply work at cross purposes and, and pursue policies that trade some harms for others. 
Great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and then we have a question from Lori Marino. Uh, a brief question, but probably a long answer. Uh, how do we keep responsibility from drifting into exceptionalism? By the way, can't wait to read the book. Uh, th thank you so much, Lori. Uh, so, so I take it that part of the concern is when we talk about human responsibility, that can very quickly lead to this notion of human exceptionalism because it trades on this idea of human agency, that, that humans are uh, systematically altering the world because we have this special kind of agency and responsibility that non-human animals lack. So how can we take our responsibility for our impacts on animals seriously without in some sense reinforcing this human non-human divide that frames our agency as special and important and their agency as non-existent. So, so that is how I'm interpreting your question. And you can put in the chat if that interpretation is wrong. Uh, but, but if that interpretation is right, I do think that that is a really important question because I, I do think that non-humans have agency too and they have language too and they have reason too. And, and a big part of the, the point of the book is that we need to recover an appreciation for their agency and their language and their reason. And to that extent, we, we need to include them in our political systems, not only as stakeholders, but also in some sense as contributors to our discussion. And of course, we need to figure out what it might mean, uh, uh, for example, by studying their cognition and behavior and learning what their preferences are and factoring those preferences into the decisions that we make and, and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, we, we have to take responsibility for the fact that human activity is systematically changing the planet and impacting human and non-human lives in current and future generations. We are now living in the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene, whatever you want to call it, a new geological epoch in which human activity, and in particular human economic activity is an increasingly dominant force on the planet. And for that reason, this old idea that we have responsibilities to, for example, captive and domesticated animals because we have directly impacted their lives, but not to wild and free animals because we exist independently of them, that is not tenable anymore. Uh, our, our activity has now extended to all animals, captive and domesticated and liminal and uh, uh, wild and free. And so we need to appreciate that in the future, when, for example, wild animals are suffering or dying uh, because of fires or floods, the types of fires or floods that are going to be more frequent and intense in a world reshaped by climate change, that we are partially responsible for that. And so we have a duty to reduce and repair those harms in part because of our complicity in those harms. And so, so while I do think that we need to allow that non-humans are agents and extend them that respect, we also need to acknowledge that our agency is reshaping the planet and, and that in the future, we need to assist other animals, not just because their suffering matters, but also because we are partly responsible for it. Thanks, great. And, and I don't know if you've seen, Laurie said that's exactly it. So you, you got the question right. Whether you nailed the answer, uh, you know, we'll let Laurie decide. But um, so uh, another question is, uh, I saw Cory Booker's review of your book. Do you think it might be possible for the NYU Animal Studies Program to form a policy proposal working group to communicate animal protection proposals to Congress on a regular basis? Yeah, thank you. That is a great question. And I am very happy to say that in 2018, we did exactly that by, by launching the uh, NYU Center for Environmental and Animal Protection. And, and so if, if you are not familiar with SEEP, the Center for Environmental and Animal Protection, then you can look it up and check out our website. This is a center whose purpose is basically to conduct and support and promote high quality research about important issues at the intersection of environmental and animal protection, the types of issues that, that impact animals and the environment globally, like uh, agriculture and conservation. And so SEEP will conduct original research and support research and then release not only uh, academic articles, but also uh, policy briefs and policy proposals that we hope will be read by advocates and policymakers. And, and this is part of our vision as a department. One of the things that we want to do is integrate animal and environmental issues because we see them as related to each other in some of the ways that I discuss in this book. But another thing that we want to do is bridge 
academics with advocates and policymakers create bridges across those three groups so that we can be producing academic research that can be useful and relevant for uh, advocates and policymakers. And so we can hear from them what they need and what their experiences are. And that can inform our choices about uh, our academic research. So, so that is what we're doing, but I am always open to scaling it up or taking on new topics. And I welcome suggestions about that. And so does the rest of the team. So speaking of producing uh, empirically rigorous knowledge that, that uh, also helps protect, you know, advance animal protection. We have a question from Zoe Newton, who's doing such work. She's one of our MA students. And uh, the question is, how should the reader interpret the term saving in the book's title? Uh, that's a, th first of all, thanks for being here, Zoe. <laughs> and second of all, that's a really great question. I had complicated feelings about calling the book Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, because I do think it suggests a sort of savior mindset that I think is not fully accurate or appropriate, given how bad we are at that sometimes, and also given that we endangered animals in the first place. And, and so I, I called the book Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, because I do think it has multiple meetings that, that, that I endorse. Uh, we, we should save animals and we should save ourselves. We should save animals partly in order to save ourselves. We should save animals partly by saving ourselves. We should save animals uh, in order to redeem ourselves. We should save animals partly by redeeming ourselves. All of these meanings, I think, are, are true and, and I, I like them. And so I read the book title that way. But there are some limitations and I might as well acknowledge them. One limitation is that um, saving animals might not always be necessary. There might be cases where animals are suffering and there is nothing that we can do about it or nothing that we can ethically or effectively do about it. And, and that might be a shame, but it might be true. There are also cases where saving animals is not sufficient. There are a lot of other things that we should do for them as well uh, as, as a result of their suffering and our complicity in their suffering. For example, we should be helping them and preventing them from getting into these, these conflicts or problems. We should be creating structural solutions that prevent these problems from arising in the first place. Um, and like I said, the, the idea of saving can suggest uh, human saviors and that suggestion is sort of inappropriate, given, again, that we put them in this situation in, in the first place. And really what we are doing is trying to prevent um, the, the crises that we have created from impacting them any more than they have to. And, and so while we should save them and help them, it would, it would be inappropriate for us that, to then give ourselves pats on the back and think of ourselves as their saviors. Uh, so, so that's why I like the title, but also what some of the limitations of the title are. Thank you. Um, given that I don't see any other questions in the chat, Jeff, I'll ask you one myself. Um, you know, there's, as you well know, and as you talk about, there's, there's been a lot of movement on the epidemiological side, the scientific side towards so-called One Health. Um, you know, I, I see you as very much bringing in, in uh, a more explicitly ethical dimension to that. So let's imagine that I invited you to give a, a keynote speech at the One Health conference in which you're going to be talking mostly to people that are more explicitly on the, the health side, whether that's animal health or human health. Uh, what message do you want to deliver to that group in particular that is, you know, that is complement, but maybe something they're not emphasizing? Yeah, thank you for asking that. I, I uh, in the book, note that there are some really interesting policy frameworks that we can connect these ideas to, one of which is One Health, another of which is the Green New Deal. There are also the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which invoke One Health. And, and I do think that a really important project is taking these practical frameworks that are endorsed by nations and international bodies, and then connecting these ideas and arguments with, with those frameworks. So with respect to One Health, this is a framework endorsed both at the national level and at the international level at the UN that basically notes that human, animal, and environmental health are linked and that our policies should reflect those links by considering animal and environmental health. And, and I think that is a really important framework and I think that we should endorse it and, and we should uh, apply it to all sorts of issues that we need to be making health and climate policy about. But there are some important limitations to our current interpretation and application of the One Health framework. One limitation is simply that uh, even, even if all we care about is human health, we are still 
not addressing issues like factory farming, deforestation, and the wildlife trade enough to uh, mitigate risks for human health and well-being. Uh, we would really need to uh, eventually phase down and phase out these industries. We need to end factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade, and for example, replace them with uh, a humane, healthful, and sustainable plant-based food system, possibly including plant-based and cultivated meats. Now, we might not be able to, to do that tomorrow, but we need to do it within uh, one or two or three decades. We need to do that in order to meet our, our health and climate targets. And so one thing that we need to do is simply come to terms with how much food is part of the, the methane reduction targets, the deforestation reduction targets, and so on, and make realistic targets for ending factory farming and replacing it with plant-based food systems. But more importantly, right now, our interpretations and applications of One Health are speciesist and anthropocentric in the sense that we are considering uh, animal health, but we are considering that for humans rather than for the animals themselves. The, the basic insight is that, hey, the more we study animal health, the more we can learn about human health. And the more we improve animal health, and prevent diseases from spreading among animals, the more we can improve human health and prevent diseases from spreading to humans. But of course, while that is an important part of the equation, animal health matters for the animals too. And so we need a version of One Health that uh, in the same way that it does for humans, regards animals as stakeholders in public health, as Aisha Akhtar puts it, regards animals as part of the public that public health is aiming to, to be in service of. Uh, and, and that would mean considering uh, health impacts on human and non-human populations for the sake of human and non-human welfare while considering human and non-human rights and justice as constraints on the types of things that we do. And, and so that would be a, a much more expansive version of One Health, but it would be great from a human health perspective because we really would be uh, treating the world in a way that is much better for human health. And we, it would be much, much better from an animal health and welfare perspective because we would see them as part of the individuals, part of the, the communities that public health is supposed to be serving. Great, thank you. And I see that uh, Desiree, another one of our MA students says that she had the same question. So unfortunately I stole that from her, but um, so uh, we have another question from Abigail Westbury, who asks, climate adaptations and public health efforts don't necessarily align with justice for animals. For example, renewable energy projects like wind turbines, solar panels, hydropower are necessary to combat climate change, but pose deep threats to animal communities dependent on environments where this technology is located. How should these conflicts and trade-offs be evaluated? That's a really great question. And, and this, this is a point that I think both Kendra and Doug commented on, which I really appreciated this idea about trade-offs. Uh, I do think that we need to take trade-offs seriously, but as, as Kendra and Doug noted, I think we can take them seriously at different levels. One thing that we can do is try to make structural changes that reduce the trade-offs that are necessary in the future. There are a lot of trade-offs that seem necessary now only because of the structures that we currently live in. Like for example, when uh, a pandemic reaches a mink farm, we might think that we have no choice but to cull all of those minks. But the reality is we have no choice but to do that because we put ourselves in that situation. And if we get ourselves out of that situation, then that might not be a choice we face in future pandemics. Uh, so there are many conflicts and trade-offs that we can simply dissolve if we create better systems, better structures, better infrastructures that can allow humans and non-humans to exist more harmoniously. And so I think that should be part of what we try to do. But then the other part of what we should try to do, I think, is acknowledge that even in an ideal system, to say nothing of in our current system, trade-offs will still be present, will still be inevitable. I mean, just the fact that some animals thrive better in warm climates and others thrive better in cold climates uh, means that no, how the climate changes is going to benefit some animals and harm others. So no matter what we do, there are going to be some trade-offs. And what we need to do is improve research and improve education so that we can really become much better at uh, uh, estimating the impacts on different species and comparing the impacts on different species so we can make informed decisions about the costs and benefits and risks for everybody involved in the same way that we do for human populations. 
When we need to evaluate trade-offs for human populations, we first try to dissolve them through structural changes, and then we use cost-benefit analyses and human rights frameworks in order to make decisions from there. And so I think we need to try to dissolve these trade-offs as much as possible, and then insofar as trade-offs remain, we need to use um, cost-benefit analyses coupled with human and non-human rights and justice frameworks to make remaining trade-offs. And, and I'll say one more quick thing about that, which is that we will need to be willing to pursue some policies that will cause some harm to, to human and non-human animals. There is no policy that will cause harm to no one at all. Everything causes harm, even plant-based food systems. Everything causes harm to somebody. And so the idea that there can be a completely harm-free or cruelty-free, well, maybe cruelty-free, but the idea that there can be a harm-free solution to any of our problems is a myth. And uh, if, if we let, let that be the standard, then we won't permit ourselves to pursue the kinds of interventions uh, and transformations that are going to be necessary in a world reshaped by climate change. So we need to dissolve the trade-offs as much as possible, re uh, resolve them thoughtfully otherwise, and just accept the fact that because we put ourselves in this situation, our hands won't be clean. We just try to, we, we need to try to make them uh, as minimally dirty as possible. So I see we have a, a question from one of our panelists, Dr. Coulter, please. Yeah, so so uh, well put and, and um, articulated there, Jeff, the, 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 the realities of imperfection uh, and, and just trying to be as, as, uh, as, have as least dirt as possible uh, on us. So along those lines, I actually have a pair of questions, but I'll keep them concise. I, I, I said I only had one in hopes that the, the, our chair would let me in, but I'll ask my two very concisely. Um, uh, and I'm wondering whether you have had any chance to look into possible synergies between the Green New Deal and the Red New Deal, which has been proposed by indigenous leaders and folks as a way of integrating um, colonial questions and actually a lot more animal questions into the US political terrain than the Green New Deal does. So whether that's something you've had a chance to or maybe you're thinking about uh, integrating as a way to try to, to, to integrate an, an equity lens and, and, and sort of a different approach to, to multi-species politics. And, um, and, and along those lines and, and may, maybe accumulating with one of the things I find the most hopeful weirdly, I, I didn't think I would be gaining so much hope from venture capitalists and angel investors um, as, as I do now. And, and I'm talking in particular about the folks investing in, uh, in lab-grown meat and dairy or alternative proteins, which is an umbrella term that includes uh, lab-grown meat and dairy. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts on whether there are certain areas where the, their political and legal leadership is most central, whether there are others where economic leadership is crucial, and whether it's a bit of both, that obviously initiatives like the, the factory farming reform bill is cultivating the sorts of terrain that, that leads to the kind of just agricultural transition or humane jobs transitions um, that we're talking about. Just sort of, if you could comment a bit on these different organizational spaces where some are ahead of others, et cetera. I mean, obviously the, the Good Food Institute folks are doing great work on this and really calling not only for there to be private sector leadership, but also public sector leadership on, on the economy and, and growth in these kind of areas. So I would, I would welcome your thoughts on both of those areas. Uh, I see that Doug has a question too. Doug, would you like to ask yours briefly and then I can respond to all three at the same time as we wrap up? Sure, sure, that'd be great, yeah. Um, so a lot of us in academia have the luxury of sort of writing without fear of having an impact. <laughs> um, but animal philosophy is you know, somewhat an, unusual in that for the last several decades, there've been very notable, direct, discernible impacts on the social movement of animal protection caused by academic philosophers. And I'm just curious, like as you were writing this work, you know, what was that in the back of your mind and how does that affect the process? Or 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 do you did you kind of imagine yourself cloistered in the ivory tower and not really worry about downstream impacts? I, I this is just a curiosity of mine. Yeah, thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, so, so Kendra, in, in response to your questions, thank you for those. Um, yes, I am very interested not only in the Green New Deal, but also in the Red New Deal and the Blue New Deal, which is the, the Green New Deal uh, for the oceans. <laughs> I, think, I think that we need to be considering all of these and, and we do need to be uh, expanding coalitions in, in part uh, because that will make them more effective, but also in part, as you note, for ethical and political reasons, because justice requires it, especially in the case of indigenous communities and their contributions to the project. So yes, I, I completely agree. Uh, with respect to your second question, 
which I need to move my screen around to see. Ah, yes, uh, venture venture capitalists and and other other contributors. Yeah, I I think this is an area where we should welcome those contributions and celebrate them. And I really like the way that you put it. And so I'll simply. Uh, reiterate what you said, which is this is one of those areas where no single solution and no single contribution is going to be enough, right? Uh, Plant-based and cultivated meat by themselves will not be enough to solve these problems, but nor will activism by itself. What, what will be enough to solve these problems are lots of different contributions from lots of different people uh, in, in, in a collaborative uh, spirit. So, so a division of labor across people seeking social change, political change, economic change, technological change, some people pursuing moderate interventions, other people pursuing radical interventions, often in ways that are at odds with each other. These are the types of efforts. This is the type of division of labor that possibly stands a chance of being successful. But no particular thing by itself, either the technological innovations or the grassroots activism will be enough, but together they might be. Uh, and then Doug, to, to answer your question, sure. Uh, did I expect that my book would, would make an impact? Of course not, that, that would be preposterous. Uh, but, but did I aspire to write a book that could, if, if I got lucky and circumstances conspired in, in my favor, uh, that could have an impact? Of, of course I did, that, that was very much the goal. And my, my goal all along in, in my career so far has been to as I said before, work partly in academia, but then also engage regularly with advocates and policymakers and other change makers and, and stakeholders and try to do work that bridges those communities and in part so that my work can be useful for uh, advocates and, and policymakers. So, so if that were the case, then I would be really, really pleased and, and excited about that. And then I would just really hope that my recommendations are good ones. Uh, and, and I know we're out of time, so I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Jeff, for writing this awesome book. And thank you, Kendra and Doug, for delivering um, such wonderful comments. Thanks to all of you for attending. I, some questions really piled in right at the end, like at 1257, 1259. So uh, Jeff, I hope you don't mind. I dropped your email in there and just said, if people want a chance, I'm sure Jeff would be very excited and we'll, we'll respond to you with the same gusto that he brought to us today. So uh, with that, uh, and now for the rest of us, we have our work cut out for us. If you've not read the book, that's your next assignment. So go read it and then email Jeff and tell him what you thought about it. Um, thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks so much, everybody. I, again, really appreciate it.